professionalism, what is it? Craig Swanger, investor, company director, former head of investments at Macquarie, shares with us his views on professionalism in the industry. Craig, before we start, at National Sales Institute, we're interested in sales. What's your view of the sales function? It's extremely wide and varied, right? So you know, sales can go from being uh, you know, highly professional, um, highly organized, um, part of the customer experience, part of customer service, all the way through to someone trying to flog you something. Right? And that's probably part of the problem with the reputation is like there's no consistency. Professionalism, it's all around us. But what does this mean to you? What is it? I mean, professional, uh, a professional is someone you can rely on for a particular outcome. So yeah, professionalism um, means to me that someone is going to act, behave in a way that's consistent by dealing with me. And then when they deal with someone else tomorrow, it's, it's this, a very similar outcome for that client. I can rely on it um, and I can hold them to account. If they're not meeting what, whatever the standards might be, I can say, well, hang on a second. Your professional standards said you need to operate like this, and you didn't. If someone's not professional, I have no recourse. I have no right to go back to them. What am I going to say? You didn't meet my standards? Or how do they know what my standards are? So just to unpack that, what do you think is the importance then of having a professional standard? Good question. Like it's, it's, it's two ways, really. From one side, it's telling the, the professional how they're expected to act and that if they don't act in that way, then there could be consequences. Uh, on the other side, for the customer, they have this brand, this sense of quality that they know going into the transaction. They, they might not have ever met the professional they're about to interact with, but they know that they're a member of a certain professional association and if they want to, they can go and see well, what are the standards for that. Normally we wind up with these kind of branding heuristics. We know when we deal with say um, a CPA, we know there's a certain ethical standard. We know there's a certain quality of accounting outcomes that we're gonna see. Um, so we know in advance, but if we really wanna go and check, or maybe we're not happy with that experience and go, that didn't feel professional. I'm gonna go into their website and check out whether or not that person met my standards. Who are the beneficiaries in professionalising a function? And more so, what value does that give those beneficiaries? I think there's probably four different beneficiaries. Um, I think it's fairly easy to understand how the customer would benefit because there's a, there's a standard, the quality standard that's, that's set with professional standards and there's therefore an expectation and, and recourse. I think for the salesperson, there's a strong benefit, both in terms of just having more certainty around what's expected of you. But naturally, if you're part of a professional organization that's valued by customers, then you, you're ultimately going to wind up being paid more. Right? So there's a clear benefit for the company. Um, there's lower friction costs when you go, I want to employ someone from a, uh, who's going to be of a reliable standard. If I can go, oh, fantastic. There's a professional organization. I'll choose from that pool because they're going to be more reliable. So I, there's less churn, there's less training, there's less issues, compliance problems. And I think for the shareholders as well, um, ultimately, and it's probably often forgotten about, but the shareholders behind the employer, um, they want more stable outcomes. They want a higher quality of revenue growth. They want less compliance problems. Imagine the shareholders of some of Australia's large financial organisations would prefer if there was some more professional standards set up a few years ago, for example. Some professions are governed by legislation, some aren't. Now for those that aren't, is it still valid for them to be professional? Oh, definitely there is, uh, whether it's self-governed or legislative governance. You know, there's a horses for courses argument. Sometimes things have got so bad, there's the need for legislation. Um, and for a lot of professions, they will probably look at other professions and say, let's never get there. Let's make sure we're self-governed and that the legislators are happy with the way that we're doing it. Um, you know, so journalism, for example, is largely self-regulated and they've done a pretty good job of when someone steps out of line, they pull them back into line because they don't want to wind up with a legislative framework because they know it will probably destroy the quality of journalism. So 
in the future, what does sales look like? Yeah, that's the, the big question, isn't it? So look, I'm, I'm a huge believer in, you know, we're right in the middle of the fourth economic revolution. This is the digital economic revolution. What's the digital economic revolution doing? It's putting a lot of power back in the hands of consumers. Now, even think about, for example, the way that people buy used cars now. I used to walk into a used car yard and I'd had vague ideas about what I wanted, no real price discovery. I had no idea what was on the lot. I showed up and someone came out and in that moment they would sell me a car. Now I go online, I'll, in, I'll have a look at maybe 20 cars um, that I might want, narrow it down to one or two, then find 10 examples of each, get a price point. I know exactly what's in the market. By the time I walk into the car yard, it's done. You know, that guy might have a chance of, of swinging me one way or the other, but really it's a transaction. He's got very, very little flexibility. That's the digital economy. Same thing if I'm putting, you know, repainting the lounge room. I, I go online for price discovery, and then by the time I've chosen someone, I've looked at the reviews, I've done some price discovery, I've measured my house, I've figured out how much it's gonna cost. The guy who comes in, yeah, unless he's got two heads, I'm probably gonna hire him, right? So sales is now not about the transaction. That's done, that's been, that's been handled by the digital economy. Sales is now about relationship management. There was always relationship managers and transaction salespeople. What the relationship managers were really good at is understanding you make sure that you treat your customer well so they come back. It's a lifetime value. Whereas the transaction manager, the used car salesman, if he doesn't sell you another used car ever, neither he, neither he nor there. Someone else is going to walk in tomorrow. So tomorrow's uh, sales function, if you want revenue growth, you're going to have to hire people who are really, really good at relationship management, which is everything from ethics to personality to technical understanding to great empathy. Craig, what an incredible insight into your world and thank you for sharing with us about professional standards. Thank you again for your time with us and sharing with us your views. Oh, thanks very much, Bert. It's like a very, very interesting topic and I think you're really onto something here. It's what the next decade is going to be all about. Mm -hmm.